See what, how the Holy Spirit leads us tonight. Real excited about this. Thank you all for all coming. And hi, Esther. For hi. for people watching on video, Matthew chapter sixteen. Matthew chapter sixteen. Keep your eye on Jerry and Barbara Seymour. Go, go ahead, um, Pastor Nate. You can hit the cord. We're ready. Oh, I already did. That's why I did that little burp. Yeah, because I wanted them to know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, my name is Jerry, and this is my wife, Barbara. And uh, we're going to be teaching tonight. And we're excited to see and receive from the Holy Spirit. Uh, according to the word of God, if two or three are gathered together, he will be in the middle, in the midst of it. And uh, where, where the Holy Spirit is, he reveals mysteries. He reveals who Jesus is and re reveals the Father. And so we're just going to welcome the Holy Spirit right now. And we're going to come expecting. We're going to come anticipating to hear from God and to see Jesus in a new way that we've never seen him before. According to the Word of God, we just thank you. We thank you everybody for coming. We thank you for having your Bible open. And uh, just we're going to have a, a, a time of lecture, so to speak. And then at the end, we will have uh, a time for discussion and, and question. So, Father, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity yes. and privilege. We thank you, Father, for your Word that you have, have given to us. And we receive your word tonight. Father, we thank you that Jesus, your only begotten son, came and lived and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The disciples said we beheld his glory. We thank you that Jesus came. The word came and dwelt among us according to John chapter 1. And Father, we just thank you for the word of God that we are privileged to have in our lap, on the table, on our phone. Father, we just thank you for the word of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the inspired word of God, we ask you, come Holy Spirit, yes. open the word of God. Show us as we delve in tonight that we perceive, recognize, and understand fresh revelation. Fresh revelation. Father, tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. So here we go. Uh, so one of the reoccurring themes that uh, I want to point out, first of all, is discernment. What we look back at chapter 15 and hear this uh, Samaritan or uh, Canaanite woman in verse 21 discern that Jesus was the Messiah, was the Lord, even when he was out of his territory. He was uh, away from his familiar uh, Jewish setting. She recognized the, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was her answer. Okay. So she perceived and she responded on that perception. Okay. Now let's see what, uh, what revelation or what lack of revelation is. Uh, consistent through chapter 16. Verse 1, and the Pharisees and scribes, and, uh, excuse me, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test him, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, when it is evening, you say, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be stormy today for the sky is is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the time, seasons and the times. O oh, evil and adulterous generation, seeking for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Okay. So they 
not only did they not perceive that uh, Jesus was the Messiah, he had been with them, he had tried numerous times to reveal himself to them and convince them uh, with the, the Old Testament prophecies, but they, they still, they could not perceive, they could not receive the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah, even though he was there, flesh and blood and bone with them, they could not accept the fact because their eyes were blinded. They kept asking for signs, the Pharisees and Sadducees, even though Jesus was doing all these miracles right before their eyes. They kept asking for signs like he was a magician or something. We do not want to take Jesus's healings or his provisions it's um, to his glory. as uh, something that he does by default. He, Jesus is not a magician magician in a bottle he's not our genie in a bottle and i think that's what um some of the pharisees were wanting him to be was was a, a little genie because every this is like the fourth time in the book of matthew that they have asked for signs even though they saw the blind eyes open they saw the deaf ears open they saw the dead race the they, demons the demons cast out they saw these things yet they were still asking for a sign. I wonder what sign would have made them happy. If all those didn't make them happy, what sign would have made them happy? I'm not sure that the sign of Jonah um, right. convinced them either. Are you looking for a sign before you believe God for something? There's not, it's not wrong. Gideon asked God for signs, but he asked him out of a pure heart. So, and then he obeyed. And then he obeyed the signs he was given, yes. So I know you can't answer us. This is not a rhetorical question. Sure, but it's, he, it's not a rhetorical question. If they can't answer. They can't answer because their microphones are muted. Don't be nice, Jerry. Be nice to me. So, Don't mess with Barbara, Jerry, or we'll all be all over you, brother. <laughs> So just in your heart, in your spirit, unto God, ask yourself, am I asking God for an unnecessary sign? Am I waiting for him? Just, just, to... like, his, just like his provisions. We talked about his provisions last week and how they're just so evident in our lives. If we just open our eyes and see, his provisions are so evident. So we don't need a sign for him to give us a sign of his provisions because they're right before us. Every time we sit down at the table to eat or every time we pull up to the gas station, put gas in our car, his provisions for us are so evident. But are you looking for another sign? And if you are, fine. But what is your heart's intent for looking for that sign? Okay? What is your heart intent? Their heart's intent, I think, was was more evil than good because they had many, many signs. Well, so uh, their, their evil intent was uh, clearly laid out in verse one. They came to test to him. Test him, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, now uh, who's going to read verse five? Uh, Wendy is going to read from five through verse 12. You have to unmute. Unmute your mic there, Wendy, before you start. There you go. Thank you. Okay. 15. Matthew 16, verse 5 through 12. I'm sorry. Okay. Verse 5 through 12. I can't see. Can't see? No, because I have a, I, I have a smaller print. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Barbara. I'll take over. I can okay, take over. thank you. Thank you. Five, five, through, five through 12, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Your mic is muted, Melissa. We don't hear you. Well, that Thanks. wouldn't work. <laughs> okay, and when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, 
take need and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Do ye Boy. not... Do ye not ye understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How, um, how is it that ye don't understand that I shake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they they howled that he made them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So we see several times in this passage, the word they perceived or they didn't perceive or Jesus perceived uh, what they were talking about. So understood or they didn't understand. Right. Um, so let's, let's just keep that, uh, that reoccurring thought that Jesus is, or Matthew is bringing out a very clear thing. What are we perceiving? What are we understanding? What are we getting from this relationship that we have with Jesus? What are we getting from the relationship that we have with the Father and the Holy Spirit? Okay, number, uh, verse five. When the disciples reached the other side, the other side of what? Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. Okay. Reoccurring. Jesus was around the water. Last chapter, we looked and he went to Tyra and Sidon, verse 21, which was on the Mediterranean coast. He went about 30 to 40 miles hike from the Sea of Galilee across the mountain to the Mediterranean. And he met, uh, was there at in the resort area of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus is often found around the water. He's either up on the mountain praying or he's with the water or near water. It just it's interesting. I don't I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to There's no doctrine. No doctrine. It's just <laughs> interesting that uh, Matthew is very clear to to notice and and describe to us that Jesus was around the water. So Jesus said, be, be wary of the doctrine of the Pharisees. But the so he used the little metaphor uh, of the leaven in the bread, because a little leaven will leaven the whole lump, uh, as we saw earlier in Matthew's writings, that it doesn't take a little, con but a little contamination or the whole pot to be contaminated. So that's what he's talking about. Be wary of the, the little bit of twist that and the, the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Be careful. And all the time they're thinking that he's still talking about bread because they forgot to bring bread. But they didn't recognize that Jesus is the bread of life. And, right. and he is their provider. And whatever they need comes from him. So can we perceive? Can we recognize? Can we get past the point that understanding that Jesus is all we need? And also can we discern what is leaven, man-made doctrine in a sermon or in a teaching versus the strict, unadulterated word of God being our instructions. Exactly. Can we discern the difference? Are we versed enough in the word? Do we read our Bible enough to know when someone is preaching or teaching us that that's not in the word? That doesn't line up 100% with the word. And we want to line up with the word all the way. We, you don't need any of Barbara, trust me. You don't need any of Barbara's opinions or input. And you don't need any of, let's say, Jerry either. I'll, 
<laughs> no, but we do need to know and be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Right. And understand exactly what is being said to them and to us today. And it takes discernment. It takes discernment. It takes discernment of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So they didn't discern that he was talking to them about the doctrine. They still thought that he was talking to them about bread. Okay. Uh, verse 13. Miss Barbara. Verses uh, 13 through 20. Undo your mic. Miss Barbara, turn your mic yeah, on. Okay. I got it. I got it. Just takes me a minute. I'm slow, right. but that's all right. Uh, 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that, wait a minute, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the king's keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. Then he, strictly, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Hallelujah. This is a powerful uh section uh powerful a few verses right here and if we can get a handle on this uh it will it'll change our lives amen i found it interesting that in verse 15 um uh, when jesus asked the question but who do you say that i am the okay. you is actually plural so he was talking in this in georgia he would have said who do y'all say that i am yeah. He was talking Amen. to all the disciples. He wasn't just, this wasn't a conversation just between him and Peter. He was speaking to all 12 of the disciples. But Peter was the bold one that answered and answered correctly. But he did ask everybody mm -hmm. in, in the group. He gave everybody an opportunity to answer. Mm -hmm. But Peter was the one who had the discernment that Jesus was the Christ. Insight. He had the discernment. Person. The revelation. Yeah, yeah. Discernment. Okay. So let's go back to uh, verse 13 for just a second. So Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. <clears throat> and according to um, Josephus, the historian, um, this area was about uh, 40 miles north, almost due north of the Sea of Galilee, and it was the center and the the, the so-called birthplace of all the, the Greek gods. All the Greek gods came and, and had their birthplace at this place. Uh, it was a, a pinnacle on the mountain. Uh, so if you were on the Sea of Galilee and you look north on a clear day, you could see this high peak and that high peak was Caesarea Philippi. It just so happened that at that location was also a, what they thought at the time was a bottomless pit. And it was a, uh, an opening to an underground uh, water uh, reservoir. And they had never been able to plumb the depths of this reservoir. And so they, started worshiping at the location saying, okay, this is a high place. So uh, they brought the gods down and opened this pit and worshiped there. So the, 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 the gods of the underworld and the gods of the heavens were, were worshiped there. So Jesus comes to this place, the birthplace 
of the Greek gods and ask. With this at his background, he says, who do men say that I am? Mm -hmm. And, okay, compared to all, all these other gods, who, who do men say that I am? And, uh, well, they said, well, as a uh, very complimentary, by the way, uh, some think that you're John the Baptist. Uh, that's good. Uh, others say that you're Elijah. Well, that, that's quite complimentary because Elijah and Jeremiah both prophesied about Jesus and pointing to Jesus. But uh, then Simon steps up because it had been revealed to him, and he declares that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God. And so this is, once again, uh, the, the, the chain of thought we see that understanding revelation discernment peter received discernment and discerned that jesus was the son this was not revealed to him as jesus said in verse 17 uh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father who is in heaven mm -hmm. now we get into uh quite a discussion on uh <coughs> upon this rock I will build my church. Uh, Nate, can you silence that mic for me, please? Uh, Who's and, Michael Barber? Yes, sir, please. Sorry about that. And uh, what is the rock that I will build my church? Is it Peter? Uh, I don't think so. I think it is the ability to perceive and recognize the revelation the truth that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, that that is the revelation that Jesus builds his church. Now, the church is not a building, but it is a group. It is a, a people. movement. People. It is people. And so I will build my people, my network, my organization on the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the called out one. Jesus is the anointed one, and that he came to reveal the Father to us and release the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what the entire kingdom of heaven is built on the earth, on the ability to receive the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I feel the Holy Spirit. Come on, preach. So, when we are equipped with this revelation, Jesus said in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So, uh, Dakota, are you ready? He's fired up. Dakota, Dakota, Dakota you able to read? You may be having a rough time. I don't, I don't know. We talked to him earlier. Uh, no, you did, but things can change drastically in 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's all right. Dakota, we'll give you another 10 seconds. Uh, Cindy or Andy, would you find Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, if Dakota doesn't come back on? Please. Isaiah 9. There he is. There he is. You able to read, brother? You're... Go ahead, Barbara. Go ahead. Something Bye. was going on with my phone. Sorry. Okay. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Please. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, yeah. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase in his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hallelujah. Amen. So, uh... Isaiah 9, uh, 6 and 7, 
it says, uh, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Okay. You, did you catch that? It says in, in, in uh, verse six. Okay. Dakota, go ahead and read uh, 2222 now, please. Isaiah 2222. Unmute you, my, unmute. Turn your microphone on, please. Go ahead. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place. That's he enough. Will That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. So we see here that uh, it is prophesied that Jesus will have the authority uh, to open doors. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open because I have placed on his shoulder the key of the house of David. Okay. What does it say over here in, in verse 19? I will give you the keys to the kingdom. It's still talking about the, the same keys. It's the same group of keys and and where are the keys kept are do you keep the keys in your hip pocket no the key is worn on the shoulder the key is a a large key it's no uh it's no little key like like we have today no it's a big thing and on the shoulder that is the key that is referred to in Matthew 6. And so you can see it is of good size, made of iron. So those things cannot just be hung around your neck. No. They're carried upon the shoulder, just like it was prophesied that Jesus would have the government on upon his, his shoulder. shoulder. A place of authority, just like... Uh, our, our military or, or any law enforcement on their shoulder, you, you have the, the documentation of their rank. And on their shoulder, I, I will place the, the key of the government will be upon his shoulder. And Jesus, so it is a, uh, a release of authority. So we, we see here that Jesus is giving the disciples and giving us and giving us yes I will give you the authority to operate in the kingdom of heaven and whatever you say whatever is yes in heaven will be yes on the earth and whatever is no in heaven will be no on the earth whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven so this is authority. Jesus is releasing authority to us right here. And we see that it is uh, authority is prophesied in Isaiah 22, 22. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. So Jesus is uh, referring and quoting Isaiah 22, 22, and he didn't have to quote the whole chapter. He just had to quote a small portion of it because they memorized so many large portions of the Old Testament. When he brought up a verse, they understood what he would say. Okay? Everybody good? I want to point out some things that the Holy Spirit has showed me, and, and this was a while ago, um, but I was studying and thinking about binding and loosing. And we use the scripture a lot of times to bind and uh, to, to loose people from uh, demonic oppressions, to loose us from evil spirits, and to bind us to, to godly traits, mm -hmm. things like that. But we also can loose us, we can loose ourselves from um, bitterness, we can loose ourselves from unforgiveness. We can lose ourselves from uh, anger, any of the resentment. and resentment, any of the things that are not Christ-like. Okay, and we bind ourselves to the Word of God. 
the promises. We want of to God. bind ourselves to what God says. We bind ourselves to God's love. We want to bind ourselves to God's joy and his peace. And so those things that are of Christ, we want to bind ourselves to. And it's like uh, putting a backpack on. You're going to carry that around with you all day long. You're going to carry around his uh, his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. We're going to carry around that joy mm -hmm. and his and love. the benefits of that backpack. Yes. And whenever, you know, you're you're in a place and you, you need a, I would just say, very a snack, you get in your backpack and you pull out some joy. And you pull out some love. And you, and you eat of the goodness of the Lord. I taste and see. <laughs> yes, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34. So, you know, when when you read that scripture again, look at it in a day-to-day, -day, everyday life application, not just when I'm up against a wall and struggle and to loose me from this trial that I'm in. No, let's use it and look at it every day. Bind, I'm going to bind myself today to God's word. I'm going to bind myself today to God's love. Well, we start that every morning, uh, we say, and quote the scripture. Um, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For I yeah. bind my tongue and I bind my thoughts so that they line up with the word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back just a second to these keys because I, I I'm, I'm fired up about these keys. <clears throat> I, 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 Let me ask you a question. Yeah, I wish you would. Okay. So Jerry, what is the foundation of the kingdom of heaven? Well, he said, "I will build my kingdom upon this rock." But it it wasn't Peter so much, but it was uh, the ability to perceive and recognize who Jesus is, that Jesus is the, the author and the finisher of our faith. And upon this rock, the kingdom of God is built, that Jesus is the Messiah and the ability to receive revelation from God. Now, we know that all 12 disciples ultimately proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ. They all received the, the revelation and the and the discernment that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. So all of them had the same discernment at some point. And, and I believe they all knew it at this point. They had seen enough. They'd walked enough. Um, so the heaven has 12 different foundations. Right. And the 12 foundations, are each one of the foundations of heaven are an apostle and so he has built his church his kingdom in heaven that we will live in and rule and reign in for eternity and his church on the earth on all of the 12 apostles jesus isn't the type of person that would call 12 and only used one right they're all equal to they're they're all just as valuable all of you and this on this screen that i'm looking at you're all just as valuable to the kingdom as jerry is you're all just as valuable to the kingdom as pastor nate is karen you're valuable to the kingdom amen because god has called you and you've perceived that jesus is the christ amen so we're all we are all valuable to the kingdom, and we all have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So we just have to learn how to use them. Revelation uh, twenty one fourteen, and the wall of the city had and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on these foundations were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and it uh, describes the color of the foundation of the wall. But so the disciples received the revelation that Jesus was the son of God by walking with him. They received power through the Holy Spirit on Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2. And then they used these keys to open up and uh, to move in this power that God had given them. 
Now, Peter was the first one who, who really got a hold on these keys. So we see that uh, on, in Acts chapter 2, Peter proclaimed the message of the kingdom of God to the Jews on Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 8, Peter was the first one to go and preach this message that Jesus was the Son of God to the Samaritans, Acts chapter 8. And then Acts chapter 10, Peter preached to the Gentiles. Now, he wasn't the only one, but uh, Peter came as a single voice and uh, was, he, Peter just was the first one to really get a hold of these keys and to operate in this ultimate authority that he gave to the church. Not only to Peter, but he gave it to the church. Period. So we're ready to go into Amen. verse 21? Yeah, 21. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from 21 through uh, 28, the end of the chapter, out of the Message Bible. But I want to point out in my New King James, it starts off with, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples. There's going to be a change now in what Jesus is doing. Jesus is changing from a public preaching, teaching type uh, situation like we've seen him do in the previous 15 verses, chapters, to a instruction with just his disciples. He's changing his focus to teach, begin to teach them about his death and resurrection. Okay? So... From this time forward now, Jesus is changing his focus with his disciples from a public, so much of a public teaching to more private teaching with his followers about his death and resurrection. I believe it, it, it uh, tickled and I believe Jesus was excited to see that they recognized that he was in the Messiah and were able to verbalize this so succinctly and accurately. Yes. Can we do that? Can we testify and give our, our public confession of who Jesus is in our life? Yes. Amen. So verse 21, then Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it was now it is now necessary. See, he's changed focus. It is now necessary for him to go to, to Jerusalem, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised alive. Peter took him in hand, protesting, impossible, master, that you that can never be. Jesus didn't... I'm sorry. What is that word? Swerve. Swerve. Oh, but Jesus didn't swerve. Sorry about that. Uh, Peter, get out of my way. Satan got lost. Satan, get <laughs> lost. You have no idea how God works. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to be, has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? And what could you ever trade your soul for? Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself before you know it. The son of man will arrive with all of the splendor of his father, accompanied by the army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you, a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place. See the son of man in kingdom glory. Amen. One else. Amen. Uh, okay. So 
like Barbara said, we see a, a turn that uh, Jesus is now uh, focusing his time and his effort in, into preparing these men to, to carry out the kingdom of God. And uh, Peter, uh, who just received incredible revelation from God, uh, still has the ability to hear Satan. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I haven't met a person yet that hasn't, has lost the ability to hear from Satan. I think we all have the ability to hear our own wisdom. Uh, I think we all have the ability to hear from God and the ability to hear from Satan. Uh, and, sometimes and, all simultaneously. Yes. And it just gives me comfort because it, it reveals that Peter is just a man. He's just a man. And he, he's not anybody special. Nope. God, And so it gives me comfort because if Peter can mess up like that, just from moments before recognizing that Jesus was the Christ and the next moment saying, no, you can't go to the cross, knowing that the Messiah had to come and die and that's suffer. What you, that's what you just got through saying. Are you going to argue with Jesus? So it's like, oh, Peter, you make me feel so good because I mess up sometimes so badly after some of the greatest services or the greatest experiences with God that I have in my life. Within moments, I could be messing up just like he did. And so it gives me comfort. Because God, God's grace is always right there. That, that is extremely important to bring out because Peter was uh, of the working class. Now, Matthew was uh, the mo more aristocratic, uh, but Peter, James, and John. He not liked. <laughs> and, no, no, he wouldn't like it at all. Uh, Peter, James, and John, Andrew, uh, and, and those over half of the disciples were fishermen and they worked for a living. They, they worked, uh, they earned their living by the sweat of their brow, their own wits, their own ability to, to bring in a living. So these guys were familiar with the people. They were used to being around the common folks of the city. And these are the ones that Jesus chose. He didn't choose the high and mighty. He didn't choose the wealthy. He chose the people that were used to being around the crowds and were well accepted. So uh, let's don't uh, look at Peter so harshly. Can we see that Peter was human and, and recognize that Jesus released to him the authority to operate in the keys in the kingdom of God. And Jesus loves humanity. Oh, so wow. there you have it. He's so compassionate. Jesus loves humanity. Hallelujah. <laughs> With all of our faults and all of our failures, Jesus I, still loves humanity. I, Hallelujah. I like Peter. I, oh, uh, Peter gives me hope. Peter gives me hope. Yes. All right. So uh, let's let's go on to verse 24. Did we assign that to somebody to read? I just read it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, deny himself, take up your cross. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now, have we heard it? Had, has Jesus said that before? Do we see that this is a repeat of something that he said before. How about uh, uh, looking at Matthew chapter 10 mm -hmm. and verse 38. Matthew 10 and 38. I'm looking, oh, there it is. Whoever uh, loves his father and mother more than me, whoever there it is. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. <clears throat> Jesus is a great teacher. He repeats, he repeats, he repeats for emphasis. Jesus told his disciples, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Deny and 
and let go of uh, Eugene Peterson said you can't be in the driver's seat. Yes, that's right. And are any of you old enough to remember the, the license plate people would put on, on the front of their vehicles? God's my co-pilot. Not. Well, that's still not a good place for God. God is our pilot. He's not our co-pilot. We are God's co-pilot. We are the one that are, you know, we're in the secondary seat. Right. Jesus is in and God is in the number one seat. God is the pilot. I'm the co-pilot. If that much. If that, if that much. Right. I'm the stewardess in the in the back. Right. In the water. So uh, we have to take up our cross. So in, in taking up our cross and on the way to crucifixion, we have no self-interest. There is nothing else more important. There's nothing important going on in our lives if we are walking toward our death and our crucifixion paul said i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live I, daily. I daily crucify myself so it is a daily picking up the cross and saying i will follow jesus dead men walking have no ambition they have no agenda they have one thing on their mind and that is, I am crucified with Christ. So Jesus is saying, this is the way I expect you to live. Take up your cross, just like I take up my cross. And he willingly stretched out his arms and they put the nails in his hands. So it is a, a willing and a daily act to follow after him. So what does this mean for whoever would find would save his life will lose it. And whoever will lose his life will find it. You got an answer to that one? I don't. Okay. I'm so glad you asked. So the the person who is prepared to bet everything on Jesus, are you willing to lose it all and and risk everything that when life's short day is done? that we stand before the Father? Or are we willing to take the risk and say, okay, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Now, at the end of life, it might be just be worms and ashes and dirt. It's easy at a poker table when you only got $50, $50 worth of chips to say I'm all in. But when you're at that same poker table and you got $5,000 worth of chips, it's a whole lot harder to say I'm all in unless you know who you're all in for. And we are all in for Jesus. F-O-J. Yes, we are all in. It doesn't matter if I gain the whole world. If I'm not all in for Jesus, willing to sacrifice it all. You can't be half in. I, I would be losing myself and everything else because it's it's a loss loss but when you're all in for jesus you're a win-win you got a win-win so as i i let go of my own self-interest that would be dying and, and losing my life to lose my self-interest would be losing life but in doing that i gain eternal life and gain the life that Jesus provides for us and gives to us. The verse 26, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And what would a man give in return for his soul? Now, this is truly a rhetorical question because yeah. in, in, in the Greek translation, there is no exchange for the soul. You cannot buy a soul. The soul has never been... Uh, something to be purchased. Uh, I know uh, the devil went down to Georgia because he was looking for a soul to steal, but you, there is nothing to exchange for the soul of man. The soul cannot be bought and it can only be given. The soul can be given to Satan or to the father. So what would a man give in return for his soul? Uh, is truly a rhetorical question. The answer is, there is no price for the soul. 
find it then. There's a verse in Psalms about that. Yes, sir. The soul is too costly. So uh, let's look at the end of this, uh, the last verse. It says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. So uh, the Peter, James, and John and the 12 disciples weren't going to face death until the rapture. What is he talking about? Well, some say they were talking about the uh, even on the Mount of Transfiguration. I believe it is. Because verse 17 introduces us to the event uh, six days later, Peter, James, and John went and saw the Son of Man, Jesus, their, their rabbi, their uh, teacher and follower, being transfigured and operating in the glory and the splendor of the kingdom of heaven. So we'll uh, work on that next week, and uh, I hope you all have uh, gotten something out of this, because I sure have. I uh, was hoping to get a little more in depth, but uh, we got I through. think you did great. I think we got through the chapter, and we're able to uh, see that Jesus is building his church on the ability to perceive that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. And can we receive revelation knowledge from the Father and Holy Spirit and through Jesus' words that will enable us to operate with the keys of the kingdom of heaven, according to uh, verse 13 through 20. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerry and Barbara. We appreciate you doing this for us. And y'all do a fantastic job. You guys are getting better and better. Y'all are going to be so good at this soon, they're going to require you to have a license. You know, <laughs> you want to be licensed. They're going to say y'all are professional. So <laughs> thank you very much. On a serious note, if you're watching this by video, at some point in the future, and you're wondering why we're all gathered here, you can't see us all, but there's about 17 of us here, and we're here to study the Word of God. And if you're wanting to understand if you're really saved, and you're going to heaven, and you hear all these kind of terms, and you feel a pulling on your heart, and you know there's a God, but you really don't understand it from a, a, a paint can, then I want you to go to deliverancerevolution.org. And it says, contact us. I want you to fill that out. It'll come to me personally. I promise you, I will respond. Normally within a day, but sometimes it's two or three days. And we're going to invite you into this ministry where you can come to various groups for deliverance and healing. We have one every day at 11 o'clock. So if you're getting attacked in your mind or addictions or any type of perversions or whatever, you can come every day and get prayer. Or if you have a terminal disease, you can come and get healed. There's also fellowship. You have this Bible study. We have other groups. It's a fellowship you can get involved in. So that's deliverancerevolution.org. Hit the link that says contact us. And we're not trying to sell you anything, okay? There's one more link. It's a prayer link. So if you need immediate prayer tonight, for instance, if there's somebody just depressed or down, there's things like who I am in Christ. You click on that. There's like 90 lines in there. You speak them out loud over you. Boom! You feel the clouds start lifting. God is real or you wouldn't be here. An atheist who's angry, who doesn't believe, he doesn't come to this group. So if you're in this group, it's not by accident. God is pulling on your heart. So let me pray real quick for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every single precious soul that's in this group. We thank you for Jerry and Barbara and the word that you're giving them, uh, the coordination and, and teamwork and, and, and back and forth dialogue that they're offering uh, holds people's attention. It makes them want to be here. It gives them a hunger for the word. And Lord, we're just asking that you do something supernatural. We started this three or four months ago with five people, and, and now here we got 17. So Lord, Lord, fill this group up. It's not about numbers, but we want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. We surrender to you. We yield 
to you, mighty God. Let your presence be in this ministry, in this group, in each and every life. Whether somebody's having a great day today or, or feeling oppressed, Lord Jesus, we just speak peace into them right now, Lord. Give them hope, Lord. Give them peace beyond all understanding. Let them realize that they're in the right place. There's resources. There's help available through Jesus Christ. You don't have to have a gut full of drugs and a head full of drugs and a bunch of lies and prescriptions from doctors. Answers in Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Flame wide these gates. Let's see his kingdom come